This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Today's guest is Tim Carney. He is a senior columnist at the Washington Examiner and a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He is also the father of six children. Thank you so much for joining us, Tim. Hey, thanks for having me. So you recently wrote uh, a book called Family Unfriendly. I don't even know if it's been released yet. I'm pretty sure the publication date uh, is a few months from now. So hopefully viewers will check it out once it is released. But, you know, you basically lay out a very interesting case for how American culture and businesses can really become a lot more approachable for families. Um Lay out the the doomsday scenario for us uh, if there's this fertility bust that continues uh, for many decades to come. Yes. Yeah, so since uh, 2008, at least when the Great Recession happened, the, the birth rate in the United States just plummeted, which was expected. That's what happens in for the short period in economic downturns. But it never recovered. It's been falling since then. And the millennials, who are much more numerous than my generation, Gen X, when they came on the scene, people expected a massive baby boom. That hasn't happened. So this has been going on for 15 years. There are now fewer children in America today than there were at the last census. There are more people in their 60s in America than there are in their zeros. That is under 10. And so if this continues, what we're going to see is the uh, workforce is uh, naturally going to shrink. And we could talk about Social Security or that sort of thing. I think that's all secondary to the fact that there will be fewer people doing work. That's the economics of it. I could go on and in Family and Friendly, I do for a few chapters about sort of the social ramifications. I think that we are we're, we're sadder. We're less optimistic when there are fewer children around. And then it spirals into the the culture that you've already referred to. When we have fewer children, we stop kind of building culture to support families, parents, and children, and thus we lead to even fewer and fewer children. South Korea is seeing exactly that, and they've fallen down below one child per uh, per woman of childbearing age. We're down at about 1.6, 1.7. Europe is down at about 1.5. And so and the rest of the world is falling as well. So in the future, if we don't start having more kids, we'll have a shrinking population, an aging population, not enough people to do work. But more important, I think we'll have a sort of a sadder, less trusting, less loving society when people don't have kids around them. But how bad will up. this well, how bad will this actually be? Like what is will this be something that is like noticeable? 10, 20 years from now, or will it sort of be the U.S. continuing on the trajectory set by Europe, where you walk around Europe and it's not as if there's, you know, it's immediately apparent that it's a completely decaying society, right? Like how, how bad is it actually forecasted to be in the United States? Well, so again, uh, South Korea is the example where they are down below one child. The replacement level is 2.1. And there, again, you do see a, a real increase of sadness, a real decrease of even the idea of getting married. There's fewer and the idea of having children. And so it becomes self-reinforcing. So that's why I don't think it's a slow, steady decline. It's a kind of thing that uh, that spirals out of control, that the, the fewer children, the more uh, the more family unfriendly our, our culture gets. And just to look at the economics, the working age population, which the federal figures on this counts at starting at age 15, that's already flatlined. So then the question is, so then the, the fact is that in a few years, that will start declining and will decline every year for the foreseeable future. That's happened in Japan. When we have fewer people doing work and more people in retirement, that's going to be a lot of problem. I don't care how big your retirement savings are. If there's not somebody you can hire to fix a leaky pipe in your apartment, it's, it's no good to you. And that will start happening in our lifetime. In For me, when I'm retired, for you guys, when you're retired, that will be the reality, that there'll be fewer and fewer workers. And again, I don't think we can overstate the cultural impact of places where all the schools are going out of business, where all the playgrounds are getting overgrown, where then in turn, the rest of the culture stops even thinking about children. 
Let me pull up a little bit of so, some data that you cited here, just because it helps people to see, I think, sometimes what you're talking about. Here's the U.S. total fertility rate uh, derived from World Bank data. Uh, you see a steep uh, decline from 1960 to 1980, and then a slower decline from 1980 to present. Uh, and then we've got you mentioned the percentage or the total number of children on you know, people under the age of 18 in the U S flatlining there. And then this shows the total number of children as a percentage relative to the total number of seniors age 65 and over. And you see those lines starting to converge and project, uh, projected to flip in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this is the world fertility rate uh, at 2.4, according to the United Nations, and projected to continue downwards. So I guess my question, taking all that into account, is like, how is a shrinking population necessarily a terrible thing? I mean, if if we have mm -hmm. lifespans increasing, more perhaps more importantly, health spans increasing, and then technology continuing to create more goods and services, presumably bringing things down and filling some of those gaps where the, you know, if the workforce is shrinking, you know, can, can automation come yeah. in and, and play a role? And like, how much, how much different, I guess, would the world look, whether we have 10 billion in the in the year 20, 2100 or six billion, um, is that a is it a terrible change in quality of life for the average American or the average global citizen? One way to think about it is this: when you retire, and so let's look over a hundred and fifty year span, even though we probably don't have to go back that far. When you retire, when you're not able to really make a lot of money later on, or when you're just tired and, and you want to kind of rest because you're 70, 75 years old, will you have your own children taking care of you, which is a very traditional model. It's kind of on its way out. Maybe with six kids, I'll be able to have that. Who knows? Will you have sort of a, a assisted living facility where there's staff there and, and they're taking care of you and they're, you know, cooking dinner and, and, and there's nurses to check on you if you're sick? Or will you have a little robot with AI zooming up to take care of you? Now, maybe that robot will have fewer, you know, uh, medical mistakes and, and less malpractice than human doctors and, and nurses. I don't buy into that techno utopia future. And I don't think most people do. I think that when we have fewer people who are young enough to do the work, it will necessarily have negative cultural effects. It will decrease trust. A lot of the studies I point out in the book show how just being around children makes people more generous with their time. This is non-parents even. Being around children makes people more generous with their time. Dealing face-to-face -face with humans who we know uh, does more to build social trust, does more to improve people's moods than dealing with uh, faceless bureaucracies, with you know automated processes and that kind of thing. So if, if you really just prefer dealing with artificial intelligence and robots and computers to dealing with people, then maybe the baby bust is, a, is good news. But uh, no, in general, I think for most people, it will, it will absolutely be bad news. And again, when you, look at the, uh, when you look at the cultures where this is happening, nobody would tell you that uh, Japan and South Korea, which are far ahead on the baby bus, represent happier places than say uh, the the countries you know United States or Northern Europe where we're at least closer to replacement level or Israel which I talk a lot about in the book which has a birth rate over over three babies per woman of childbearing age the 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 a shrinking society and an aging society I think inevitably is a sadder society and I, I lay out lots of arguments for that in in the book as well. As a techno utopian yeah. Catholic, I just want to make it very clear that I want to have as many children as possible. And then in my old age, I want them to be AI enhanced uh, to be able to help with medical <laughs> diagnoses. But I, I do still want like my kids to be taking care of me, right? Like surely yeah. there's a middle ground for those techno utopian Catholics out there, right? 
Yeah, and I'm, yeah, I'm a uh, <laughs> yeah, and you know I, I'm I'm a father of three, uh, so you know I I, I love being around kids. Um, Liz has uh, a baby and I'm uh, ho hopefully more on the way uh, in that not too distant future. Uh, we're, we're both amateurs uh, in relation to your your brood of six. Um, but, you know, at, at the, bot the bottom the bottom line for me is I, I am as a libertarian, I don't really care how many children any individual chooses to have. Um, what I do care about is are people unable to have the number of children that they want to have. And so one of the stats that you cite uh, regularly in your book um, that was concerning to me was this gap between the number of children that people say they want to have and the number they end up having. Um, this is just one example of the, the polling on this question, Gallup polling over the years, showing 48% of people want two children. Uh, uh, this is Americans, 25% uh, say three, 13% say four or more. Uh, so, you know, a, a large majority want at least two kids. I think you put the number somewhere between two and three is the average, like 2.4, 2.5, something yeah, the, like that. The, the mean comes yeah. out to be 2.7. But on that, on that chart, one of the most important things is it's 5% that say they want one or none. That's right. that's below what I'll call the the brown cow line of polling. Some of you guys might remember a poll that came out about 10 years ago that for some reason asked people, where does chocolate milk come from? And one of the answers was it comes from cows like regular milk, but those are brown cows. And that's why it's chocolate. That was 7%. 7% is a negligible number in any <laughs> poll. You had 5% of African-Americans at one point say that the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was a mistake. So these are people who like misheard the question or are trolling mm. the pollster. And that's the level of people who say they want zero or one. We, and I mm. think they are overrepresented. I think all of those 5% of the people who, who meant to answer the question that way, I think they're all columnists at the Washington Post right now because you would assume that there's a massive child free by choice or I just wanna have one kid by reading the main media, but that's the most shocking thing about that. Yet people are ending up increasingly with zero or one children. Um, mm. And so, and I think it's, it's sad that the number of people who say they want less than four is falling. But again, we can bracket that question. Uh, what people want, what people choose. As commentators, we, we try to nudge people one way or another. But from a perspective of cultural or policy failures, if people want two and three kids, yet they're getting between one and two, and a record number are getting zero, then that shows us that something is wrong. Now, how I'm much, based in Washington. How, and so, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, I, I just want to know, like, how much can we infer from that? Uh, or, you know, what can we infer from that in terms of changing expectations? Like once you have one kid or two kids and you mm -hmm. start to realize, OK, maybe this was more <laughs> time consuming than I expected. And I'm going to like dial back my expectations a little bit or, or my desires change uh, once I started having kids. Um, you know, how how much do we know about that changing psychology? So the most of what I've seen uh, that the biggest thing that has changed is the optimism that, and the desire to have multiple kids and keep working full time in your current job outside of the home. That's where after baby number one, the, uh, the expectations get dialed down. And some people will say, okay, you know what? I can only have one kid because I can't afford two daycares or something. But in fact, a larger portion say, you know what? I just don't value work as much as I did before I had the first kid. So there's definitely a recalibration of expectations, but it's mostly how much can you straddle a full-time job and being a parent. And uh, I, another thing to, so again, for me, this reflects that there's something wrong if people want this thing and then decide that it's out of reach. So the way I, I phrase it is, what is the ideal family size? Well, we often fall short of our ideals. So then we have intentions that are less than our ideals on anything, right? I have an ideal house. I'm house shopping. I'm not going to get that. What, what do I expect or intend? 
that's always going to fall short of your ideals. But then what people, millennials especially, are attaining is far less than even what they intend or expect. So their intentions are, are a lot lower than their ideals. And what they get is a lot less than their intentions or expectations. To me, that reflects a real cultural problem. Well, so how much can this be chalked up? I mean, this is a huge debate within the sort of pronatalist circles. Uh, and I think libertarians tend to have a lot of pushback on this. How much can this be chalked up to women choosing of their own volition based off of you know, their own analysis of trade-offs to have children later? Uh, what do you make of that? And how do you factor that into the equation? Because the thing that I definitely don't want to get into is a situation where a bunch of pundits are you know, shaming women for choices that they made that may be good choices where they had full information or maybe kind of sad choices where they wish they'd done something different. But regardless, there's a little bit of this like, well, this is the cultural shift that we see as women enter the workforce and have more opportunities available to them in greater numbers than ever before. Well, so certainly when people say that having kids is less affordable, um, the fact is that's mostly false except for in two ways. In the last four years or five years, housing prices have gone crazy. But the baby bus is 15 years old. So the housing affordability question um, can't really explain what's been happening for the last 15 years. The other way in which it's become, the real way in which it's become less affordable every year for the last 30 years to have children is that the opportunity cost has gone up specifically because women are more educated. They're more educated than men in America today. And they have much more professional opportunity than they did in the past. And so that is a real trade-off and life is full of trade-offs. We can't get rid of trade-offs. But my argument is that there are things that a culture can do, some through policy, some through uh, other cultural forces, and you mentioned employers, and I would say communities and all sorts of things, religious communities, uh, local libraries, et cetera, extended families, our individual choices. There are things we can do to make it easier to reduce the severity of the trade-offs, to reduce the opportunity costs of having kids, whether it's vis-a-vis uh, -vis a career or vis-a-vis -vis just having a social life. And that's the job of culture is to make it easier for people to attain their ideals and to lessen the cost of people pursuing real worthwhile, noble ideals. You know, there was this video that was circulating the Internet a few weeks ago about the uh, the Dink community, the double income, no kids. Uh, there was a TikTok trend where people are describing what is life as a Dink and why uh, why am I choosing not to have kids? Why am I choosing this child free life? I thought that we could play a uh, role that clip of this one that went viral uh, because it's a good jumping off point to talk a little bit more about these trade-offs and these choice, why people are making these choices and how much these choices are actually grounded in the economic reality. So Bess, could you run the Dinks clip for us? We go to Trader Joe's and workout classes on the weekends. We're Dinks. We get into snobby hobbies like skiing and golfing. We're Dinks. We can go to Florida on a whim. We're Dinks. We're already planning our European vacation next year. Dinks. We get a full eight hours of sleep and sometimes more. <laughs> <laughs> We're Dinks. We get desserts and appetizers at restaurants. We're Dinks. We can play with other kids and give them back. <laughs> <laughs> We're Dinks. We still do it three times a week. <laughs> We're Dinks. We spend our discretionary income on $8 lattes. <laughs> We're dinks. We max out our 401ks, Roth IRAs, and HSAs. We're dinks. We don't use our kids or dog as an excuse to leave a party. We just leave. <laughs> so, I, I mean, my uh, reaction to this initially was like, uh, it, it, first of all, it, it is funny and like, you know, it's okay to be a dink and, and dink life is fun. But I felt that like they were they were kind of overstating some of the material sacrifices. But what what are your thoughts on the dink video, Tim. Well, first thing I, I would think is, so I'm in a different stage of life than you guys. My oldest is a high school junior. My youngest is seven years old. And my wife, my our problem is that our, our social life is too crowded because we are kids, uh, friends, and, and we have tons of parties. And we're, again, we're renting now. And so we don't, 
you know, host throw parties as much. And one of our kids, I overheard somebody said, oh, do your parents entertain a lot? And one of my kids said, no, my, my parents are entertained a lot because we're going to other people's <laughs> houses for parties. And so they're, A, they're comparing themselves to people, um, you know, with babies and, and very young children and not to people with, with grown children who, you know, occasionally are able to get up and leave. Um, and on the other hand, the idea that, maxing out your HSA is like really something to celebrate and talk about while on your vacation in, in Florida. Uh, <laughs> that struck me as sort of a very sad note right there. And this is one of the things that I encountered as I went around and I talked to people. I A big part of my job has always been what I call bar reporting or coffee shop reporting, just mm -hmm. talking to strangers. And the great thing about writing a book on parenting is that everybody has something to say. Either they are parents or they want to be or they've chosen not to be. And one of the, the things was the, the sadness, the, the sort of banality of the explanations behind why I'm not going to become a parent. A lot of times it was one woman just said, I'd love to have kids. I love spending time with kids. I'd love to have my own. But it would, it would weaken my career a little bit. And then if my husband divorced me, I, I'd be in a disadvantageous place. So basically, it was like unemployment insurance. It was this insurance yeah. policy, basically, why she was not making this choice. And so yeah. just to see some of those things, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, we've all had bad reasons for doing things. And some of those are, are, are pretty sad. $8 lattes um, is a pretty sad reason to not have kids. Yeah. And uh, to your earlier point, you know, some of the, I feel like there's, there are a lot of economic myths out there. Uh, I mean, housing is one thing. That's a, that's a serious impediment, I think, to a lot of people having kids. And we can talk about housing a little bit later. But as you note in your book, millennials have as much wealth as prior generations. And as you go up the wealth ladder to a point, you start having less kids. So it's not yeah. so clear that it's just about economics. Um, and, um, you know, could it be that some of that mythology just needs to be punctured? The idea that we're like more strapped than ever and kids are going to bankrupt you. No, absolutely. And um, Jeremy Horpdahl is the is, is the numbers guy who's who constantly does this. He just does an inflation adjusted uh, wealth and income comparing boomers to Gen X, I'm always grateful that he remembers that we exist because most commentators don't, but boomers to Gen X to millennials at a given age and shows that the, the wealth is basically equal across those three. And um, affordability of certain of goods that a family would buy, how does that compare to you know, hours of work? And he shows that that is largely stable across the, the last few decades. And so... The, the affordability thing, I keep coming back to culture. I think part of it, and uh, Angela Rashidi, who's my colleague at AEI, and Melissa Carney, who's at uh, Brookings Institution and, and University of Maryland, they keep pointing out that part of the reason that it feels so much more unaffordable to raise kids, and to some extent is can be less affordable depending on your life, is that fewer people have a culture that surrounds them that helps them raise their kids. Largely, I'm talking about extended family. When my kids were little, my wife's little sisters babysat them. Now that my wife's little sisters have babies, it's my oldest, that same one who they were babysitting, she's babysitting her cousins. And that's a sort of culture that's very pro-family, that's very supportive. In Israel, it's just very explicit because people are expected to have kids. People are expected to help other people take care of kids. There's not a mindset of, oh, your kids were your choice, like buying a boat. So it's your problem. And I'm not really, I'm not talking about welfare state policies or that sort of thing. Let's talk about cultural expectations. You should help people raise their kids. You should have a community that's pro-family that expects people to show up at whatever you're showing up with kids in tow. And that if, if you live in a culture or subculture that's not family friendly, you think I have to pay for everything. And then life mm -hmm. does start to become less affordable. 
Yeah, I have been thinking about these themes so much because I wrote a piece for Barry Weiss's publication, The Free Press, um, about being a quote unquote young mom, which is a little bit of a, an absurd thing because I had my child at 26, right? That's not particularly mm -hmm. young by global standards. That's not even particularly young by American standards. Uh, it's the median the median age at first child in the United States for women is 26.3. So like right fully, you know, very much the norm. However, in my milieu of journalists who live in New York City, upper middle class women, college educated, went to like a pretty good school, that whole like subset of American society, this is something where, you know, having a kid at 25 or 26 is very unheard of. And there's this cultural expectation that you'll push it off until later. So the thing that's been so interesting for me is like, you know, I was in this like Park Slope moms group and it was fascinating to me, the things that the 40 year old moms, because many of them were legitimately, you know, 15 years older than me, the things that they think you need to have in place before having a child mm -hmm. and even the physical goods that they think you need. It, it feels as though we almost have concocted a, a sort of absurd sense of how much having a kid actually costs. And surely if you buy absolutely everything new and expect to be shelling out $200,000 for your kid to go to, uh, you know, a, an excellent elite college yeah. and you're expecting to pay for daycare for every single year, um, you know, so that you can maintain your job. Sure. Having a kid is awfully expensive, but there are an awful lot of ways to minimize these things and to come up with more creative arrangements to get around all of that. Um, to me, it seems like there's like, if we look at things one way and if we assume that, you know, X, Y, and Z things must be in place before starting a family, of course, it seems unattainable to an entire generation of, of women. But if we rethink what things are necessary precursors, it really changes. Absolutely. And so I ran uh, focus groups and actually it was the men in my focus groups who were more likely to say, look, the reason I'm not ready and won't be ready anytime soon to have kids is because I don't want to just give them the bare minimum. I want to give them the best of everything. I can promise you guys, I do not, we do not give our kids the best of everything. We, we found a used piano and it's still out of tune and they still love playing on it. Okay. They, we send them once we made the mistake of, of travel baseball, that's a whole discussion in the book, but basically we send them to the local rec leagues and, and all of that. And the, you know, they do the basic violin lessons at school. None of them has gotten good at violin, trumpet, trombone. One son is good at guitar because he's interested in girls now, but we haven't given them lessons or, or, or the best of everything. And that idea that you do have to give the kids the best of everything, that's again, not just a cause, but a consequence of smaller families, this idea that I cite in the book of, um, well, it's good that we're choosing quality parenting over quantity. I argue it's not good because then it makes people think you have to give your kids these really expensive enrichment, et cetera, the best of everything. And then you have fewer kids. And then because you have fewer kids, you invest more in each. That's not necessarily even good for the kids or the parents. If everybody's constantly anxious that playing the piano goes from something fun to do around Christmas with Christmas carols to being basically a job that's going to get you your scholarship into college. Nobody's happy or the high quote quality parenting isn't high quality. It's just more expensive and more anxiety inducing. I yeah. love that part of the book because um, you're, you touch on so many themes that uh, it's basically just like parents, can you chill out a little bit? Um, this is like very present in the work of Lenore Skenazy with free range parenting um, or Brian Kaplan's, uh, you know, selfish reasons to have more kids. Uh, the themes that unite all three of these kind of schools of thought uh, is like you don't need to be putting them, uh, all your kids on this uh, preformed track to get to some magical destination. You can let things play out a little more spontaneously a little bit. The challenge then is like if we're in this culture that that does uh, kind of incentivize getting on that track, what do you think are the best ways to escape that? Is it just a kind of bottom up uh, countercultural movement? Yeah, I'm being countercultural. And this is one of the things that I've done. I've started multiple baseball teams. I, the book uh, Family Unfriendly starts with the t-ball program I discovered and then copied, which was all based around being actually family friendly. The point of my t-ball program was to bring all your kids and ignore them 
including the one playing t-ball while we serve burgers to your family. The baseball teams I started, I told the parents, we're not going to practice. We're just going to go out and play the game. We didn't even have the take sign. In other words, we told our kids, if you can hit the ball, hit the ball because baseball is more fun that way. And our job is not to improve your stats and win as many games, but to have fun playing baseball. And maybe you'll get better at it and try out for the varsity squad one day. But, uh, but yeah, being countercultural, and you find that people gravitate towards that. They say, oh, I'm allowed to not care so much about it. And to, to, so it was with my, my second half of my children that I started being very loud and explicit and not just trying to say, you know what, I want this, but to just loudly say, hey, I'm starting a t- baseball team that's not going to practice. We're just going to play in the games. Who wants in? And boom. Uh, people come. So there, there's that demand for it, but people feel bad because they nobody wants to choose lower quality uh, parenting. But being countercultural really is uh, absolutely necessary. And new parents can be can be reluctant to do that. Yeah, it, it does seem like that is a, a part of your your case for, you know, having six kids is you cannot helicopter parent six of them. The <laughs> yes. helicopter is not fast enough to get to all of them uh, or, you know, you can't tiger mom them. Yeah. Um, you know, a, another part of your sh- kind of sh- bar bar stool or shoe leather reporting is you were talking to a lot of people uh, who were referencing the movie Idiocracy, the Mike Judge <laughs> film, uh, which it's a very famous introduction, uh, and I've also pulled that clip, which I want to roll and talk about a little bit. Uh, Bess, could you play the Idiocracy clip? Evolution does not necessarily reward intelligence. With no natural predators to thin the herd, it began to simply reward those who reproduced the most and left the intelligent to become an endangered species. Having kids is such an important decision. We're just waiting for the right time. It's not something you want to rush into, obviously. No way. Oh shit, I'm pregnant again! Shit! I got too many damn kids! I thought you was on the pill or some shit! Hell no! I must have been thinking of Brittany. Brittany? No, you can't! What? There's no way we could have a child now. Mm-hmm. Not with the market the way it is, no. God, no. That just wouldn't make any sense. Come on over here, bitch! He don't care about you! Yeah, well, there must be something he likes over here. Don't mean nothing to me, baby! Oh, shit! It wasn't me! It wasn't me! Well, we finally decided to have children, and I'm not pointing fingers, but it's not going well. And this is helping. I'm just saying that before I have in vitro, maybe you should be willing to... It's always me, right? Well... Not my sperm count. <laughs> so implications are obvious. Having a lot of kids is for stupid people. Um, why do you think that this endeavor, right? Like that's the, the yeah, implication. Yeah. Exactly. It, why, why do you think that it has such cultural resonance? What does that say about attitudes towards kids and family? Uh, and I, I love it because I first heard about that uh, movie. The first time anyone ever asked me, have you watched Idiocracy? I was at a, a Reason Happy Hour and said to one of my friends there that I was expecting my second in 2008. And she said, oh, have you seen Idiocracy? And I think she meant it in a, uh, a friendly, uh, joking way. But uh, then when she explained the plot, I wasn't sure how to take it. Um, and yeah, and this is something I encountered in a, a playground in New Milford, Connecticut, which I highlight as a a shrinking town. The playground was outside of an elementary school that's closed down and was currently hosting senior yoga instead as sort of the, the, the future. And I think, again, the idea that it's smart and both sides get mocked in this movie, right? Like the, the yuppie couple with the 140 IQs are not coming out as, as the, you know, the prudent, the, the people to look up to. But right. really the idea that raising kids is this because it's become such a choice, because it's not just kind of something you do. Now, there are subcultures where finish school, get a job, get married, have kids. It's just kind of what you're expected to do. And, well, if you're going to deviate from that, you're making a different choice. That's fine. But now it's not even that. It's not expected. It's it's like choosing what color sweater you're going to put on in the morning. It's, it's an explicit choice. It's a, a lifestyle choice. Because of that, A, it, the 
it leads to a culture that says it's your problem if you have kids, but B, it makes you feel, and I quote Stephanie Murray, who's a great parenting writer on this, it, it once it becomes a choice, then you have to do it all exactly right. It's like you, I would tell my kid, don't go to college if you're not going to try to get good grades and that kind of thing. And this is what people say, if you're not going to absolutely do it right, make sure you have everything in order, make sure you have the house in the right school district and you have the savings to send them to college and you have lined up the piano teacher, et cetera, then don't do it. And so that's again, the way in which I think it's a self-reinforcing thing. As people have fewer children, their perception of the amount of inputs you need to do into child rearing goes up which then makes parenting seem more daunting, which causes people to put it off. And sometimes you put it off too long and it's no longer in the cards for you. To me, the opposite vision of this is um, the sound of music, right? Like there's a little bit of horseshoe theory at play where it's like, okay, the poor and low class family and idiocracy, okay, they have a ton of kids. But then there's also, we see this actually um, in a lot of the data surrounding this, Sometimes it's the ultra wealthy families like, you know, Christopher Palmer's family and Sound of Music who end up having a whole bunch of kids and then they essentially live the libertarian dream, right? Like they have a governess, they do micro schooling, like it's it's an awesome sort of like means of, you know, you can really scale up the family. But so it, do we need cultural messages like that where we also show this being like a very high class thing or do we need cultural messages where it's just seen as like ultra attainable to you? What's the... You What's we the need ideal? Universal here? manners. Yeah. <laughs> we need Maria think, uh, Montrap to come and raise all of the children for all of the families. I don't think perfectly behaved kid, the image of perfectly behaved kids is the, the right one. Um, to give an, uh, uh, an example, I try to get my kids to hold, especially my sons, to hold open doors for people because that's really easy to teach them. And it's really easy to just say one word as you walk by them, door, and then they'll hold the door open. And that makes other people happy. And it's really, my kids can't sing in unison. Again, I have a son who can play the guitar and that's the extent of the music. And I actually go- They don't wear little outfits made out of curtains. You don't have anybody making them outfits out of drapes or anything. I, What's the point I of having- I criticize the momfluencers in my book. The, you know, the Instagram moms who everything is- perfect. And specifically the ones who they all live in farmhouses is a bizarre thing that I can't understand. And the reason it's, I, you, I can't understand because it's supposed to look, oh, well, we are going a simple route. I mean, mm -hmm. that farmhouse they made with the first 5 million they made off of their influencer cash. Um, they often started with cash and the simple route, like you notice a denim is all like made to point perfectly towards the hues of the ballerina mother's blue eyes, right? Like it's, none of it is simple. It's all in, extremely curated. None of that helps people have kids because that's what causes people to say, oh, I have to have my life that much in order to raise kids. To have kids who are basically happy, who, you know, and they eat nuggets and French fries for dinner at least once a week. That's the kind of attainable image of the parent. I actually praise in Family Unfriendly, I praise the lawn that's scattered with like footballs and tricycles. And there's some dead grass from where the, you know, the home plate was left or the skateboard was left upside down to be a little bit messy and happy and that sort of thing. And not, not perfect kids, not Ivy League kids. So I, you know, have lower ambitions for your kids is one of the messages I have in the first two chapters for the book. So maybe it's, it's not cheap. idiocracy or sound of music. Maybe it's like cheaper by the dozen. Remember like that yeah. movie, I guess there was yeah. the original one and then the Steve Martin remake, right? Even cheaper by the dozen um, because he's like militaristic. That did set for me a tone. And I admit in the book, I say, when I'm a bad dad, when I lose my temper, it's because I want to think of myself as militaristic. Like if I whistle, my dog's calm, a certain whistle. In Cheaper by the Dozen, he has a certain whistle where his 12 kids come. And again, there's a couple things I'm, I'm good at, which is my kids open the door and they behave well in mass. But after that, I, I try to be, you know, relatively laissez-faire with, uh, with the kids, don't always succeed at that. But yeah, that, 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 that model, that the things you think you need to do for your kids, you don't. 
They might look like a mess sometimes. Your house will look like a mess sometimes. Your kids won't get into Harvard, but that those things are all fine. That's the main message that I think needs to get conveyed to people. Now, does that sound to you like I'm saying you should live, you know, be a dude having babies with all his neighbors in the trailer park? Well, if they, those sound the same to you. I'm sorry, I don't have much to say, but I think you can see sort of a stable couple with a, a moderate income and just trying to raise happy kids, that that definitely is doable. Even in this world, you do have to change your expectations. So taking us to a uh, terrain where maybe Zach will start to, to fight us, Tim, I did want to ask you, you write in the book about how our meritocratic secular society has forgotten that we have innate value. Do you think that sense of innate value can ever truly exist in a secular society? Well, I think that in I think that ultimately it is our secularization that makes us less believe in innate value. That makes us think our kids have value if they accomplish something good. Um, and that, you know, I'm always reminded of Donald Trump's horrible explanation for how he went from being pro-choice to pro-life was he knew this single woman who was pregnant. He thought she should have an abortion 18 years later. She, he meets the kid and the kid was really successful in life. So he changed his mind. That to me is like the worst possible explanation for welcoming life is this kid might get into Harvard. So don't abort him. But I do think that that reflects our secular view of children, that children are good if they are successful in these measurable ways. And I do think that that is a that materialism uh, is a fruit of a secular society where we stop seeing people as, I mean, I'm, I'm a Catholic. I think we are made in the image of God. I believe that every human being has basically infinite value, but I don't think that's an exclusively religious argument. I think it's inevitable that a secularizing society will hold on to that value less dearly. But I also do think that a, a secular society can see, okay, wait a second. If we do hold that human life really is valuable in itself, that we'll ultimately all be happier. In other words, I do think you can make an almost, almost make a utilitarian argument for that idea that uh, humans have value. But the fact is that the more secular any society has gotten in recent history, there's been sadness that's gone together with it. And I think if we look around today, I think uh, with Gen Z especially, you see a guilt and a dark foreboding fear of the future, which is supposedly what the fire and brimstone preachers were, were driving home. But now it's actually what the fire and brimstone op-eds about climate change are driving home. So I think it's hard to really see human life as fundamentally good in our current secular society. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really disagree with too much of that. I, I I think the foundation of liberalism is really the the val the value of the individual. Um, you know, it, everyone is treated equally under the law because everyone has an equal amount of dignity that needs to be respected. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in the book, it's interesting because you use Israel, which you've mentioned a couple times, and Utah as examples of unusually fertile cultures. And obviously, a lot of Jewish people in Israel, a lot of Mormons in Utah, so religion plays a role, but it seemed like something emanates out. And it's not just the religious people living in those areas who are unusually fertile. Um, what lessons do you draw from places like Israel and Utah? Yeah. So one of the things I always say, and I said this in my previous book, Alienated America, is that the effect of religion on cultures doesn't come from the sermons as much as it comes from the culture. It doesn't come from the catechism as much as it comes from the culture. That what happens is religious institutions and religious based institutions of civil society build a family friendly culture. So I jokingly say pregnancy is contagious because uh, a demographer in Utah told me that the Catholics in America that have the most babies are the Catholics who live in Utah. In other words, living near Mormons makes you get pregnant. <laughs> and so that it's obviously not a virus that spreads in the air, but it is 
a culture that gets built up by people who hold family very dear, they then build up a culture that makes it easier. You could, if you want to put in purely economic terms, makes it more affordable to have kids. I put in ecological terms, they create fit habitats for raising families. So the most important data point I got from Israel was secular Jews, which in the census, they're counted as their own categories. These are people who identify as Jews, but you know, they'll eat bacon cheeseburgers and shrimp and you know they only they, they might celebrate Passover but they're not keeping the Sabbath secular Jews in Israel average 2.0 children that's far more fertile than any country in Europe and then the United States so that is the religious Jews have a lot more than that but the culture that's built around the religion the, I, I make an image of a garden it's a garden that is uh, creates an environment, an ecosystem that's pro-family. And so I even ran into this guy who was complaining of, in Israel. He was complaining, oh yeah, the religious over in Jerusalem, they have too many kids, yada, yada. And while he was complaining about this, he was kicking a soccer ball with his four-year-old son. And then at one point, his wife came over and handed over his two-year-old daughter to him. <laughs> and so I was like, the anti-kid people in Tel Aviv have two kids. And they were young enough, they might have three or four. I, I would take that over here. What exactly, like, break this down for us more. Well, you know, I, I I don't want to be relegated to a fate of sitting in, you know, Utah Chuck E. Cheese's for the rest of my life. But I assume it's more like, you know, kibbutzim, like communal child rearing type stuff than, you know, higher in prevalence of Chuck E. Cheese's. Like, what is it exactly about these cultures that makes it, like, would Zach's family move to Utah and immediately be just thriving? Well, so, yeah, in Israel, one of the lines that somebody told me was, the bus drivers in Israel have a real affection for little children. So just imagine that, where you send your eight-year-old to the bus stop, not worrying that the bus is going to pull away or that the guy's going to bark at your kid or anything like that. You just say the bus driver is going to stop and help the kid on and, and, you know, make sure somebody gives him a seat. There's another, uh, one of the dads who was, uh, he's a, he was Orthodox. He has two young kids or maybe three. He, he hopes to have a, a lot of kids. And he said, well, a six year old can walk to school. Six year old knows he can't cross the street on his own. And so any adult who walks up to a crosswalk knows there might be some stranger's kid there who you're going to wait and then take them across the street. The expectations, the restaurants, it's normal to have kids there. If you need help with your children, somebody will help you out. All, there is not the mindset, your children are your own problem. There was recently a Reddit, um, am I the asshole thread? where this woman was like, well, my, my sister needed, wanted to take a shower and wanted me to watch the kids. And I said, I have no obligation. That was your decision to have the kids. I'm not even going to watch your kids. I mean, A, your kid probably can be left alone while you take a shower. But B, no, you should help your sister. Ron Johnson, the Republican senator in opposing the child tax credit said, I've never thought that it was anybody's, it was society's responsibility to help people raise their kids. You could set aside the policy debate and say, no, actually, I do think in these in these subcultures and these cultures like Israel and Utah, it, there's just a ton of little supports and expectation. People are going to have kids and we should all help them out and support that in their undertaking. I wonder whether um, thinking about like the New York City restaurant scene, um, whether there's also like incentives for places to be more family friendly. I think about, you know, I've gotten icier treatment while bringing my son um, to certain restaurants before, but I'm thinking of two places, Baltazar in Manhattan, which is always extremely, you know, I think they kind of let us jump in line a little bit in terms of waiting for a table mm -hmm. um, versus other people. There's a little bit of like accommodating families, noticing the children are hungry. And then a place called Bonnie's in Williamsburg. And I've noticed that like there are certain restaurants, you know, high end that I'll go into in New York where I'm it stands out because they're so accommodating toward families. And I do wonder, like, to what degree do they have a natural incentive to do this? Because it's something that at least, like, I notice this as a parent, and it makes me frequent these restaurants far more than I would otherwise. Well, but it would be incredible to an entire culture of that, where I never go into any New York City restaurant and feel a sense that my son is unwelcome. As, as a parent of six, I actually, my wife and I do occasionally really relish a, a child-free environment, but that's, again, that's, 
if we, we went on our 15th anniversary to like an adults only resort. And by the end of it, we were like four days is a maximum. We miss, missed our kids. I don't think we missed our kids for the first three days. So if you're going to have a restaurant that's basically going to be child free, I, there, there's definitely a place for that in society. But that your normal restaurant, there was this great place called Hamburger Hamlet in Maryland that looks like a fancy restaurant. But if you show up with kids, again, you use the word, they accommodate you, which is not strictly sh treating everybody equal. They're actually giving They're a, yeah. a, a special uh, a, a preference for the families with kids because the families with kids need it because sitting at a table when you're a little kid at a, at a restaurant is a hard thing to do because you don't naturally sit still. So that sort of idea that culture accommodates families is, uh, is important. And the more that it happens, the more that it happens. And again, it doesn't preclude having a, a, a small set of uh, child-free places. It does mean that the norm is you expect to kids to be brought to that place. If you go to a conference and speak in a conference in the United States, nobody has their kids there unless it's like a super Catholic or super Mormon conference. And in Israel though, that the speaker who has a PhD will be up there and his kids will be running around in the, in the front of the audience that I, I would love that to be more normal in, in you, Washington, DC. You, you can tell I'm a little too steeped in libertarian culture because I was, I went to um, Bethany Mandel and Carol Markowitz's book party, maybe like last year. And I had, my son was, I think, you know, four months old or something, five months old at the time. And it was in Manhattan, sort of like in this, you know, bar, hotel bar. And I was sort of deliberating, oh, should I, should I bring my child with me? Or should I just, you know, leave him home with my husband? And how silly of me to assume that Bethany, who has a bunch of kids, wasn't also bringing a kid, right? Like I, I show up to her own book party and her her baby's like in a sweet little sling. And I'm like, oh, wait a second, I'm with conservatives. I'm pretty sure I could have just brought my kid and it would have been no big deal whatsoever. Uh, but there is something so lovely about, especially as a younger woman going into professional environments, when you see other people who are more established in their careers and more established uh, in you know building their families, there is something that's very eye-opening about like, oh, Bethany is doing that. Okay, I'll just do that next time. Perfect. And this is, I, I say this specifically about the workplace that um, a lot of people in trying to become, a lot of employers try to become more family friendly by providing uh, better daycare, more maternity leave and all, all that stuff is great. But I say that the, one of the most important things that an employer can do is tell you your family is more important than this job. And one of the most important things, someone like me, you read my titles earlier, they're senior in both of them, right? I'm not that old, but I have been at the examiner longer than anyone else. I've been at AEI for over 10 years. And when I get up and leave and I say, okay, I got to go home. My kids need me. And so then the trade-offs that women have to make, because women do a disproportionate amount of the child rearing, the trade-offs that women have to make, the, the way to alleviate the negative impact on their career is not to say, oh, we're going to make it so you don't have to spend more time with your kid. It's to say, you know what, dads, you ought to go off and spend more time with your kids. And that's someone like me right now, I'm not a boss, but I am a senior guy. And I make it clear, my family is more important than my jobs. And that that, again, is setting norms and expectations. So this is something that I, I think that this has, it's a conservative argument, as you're suggesting, but it should have broad uh appeal to the libertarian audience, I believe, because what I'm saying is not all, it's not mostly about government policy. It is mostly about norms and expectations and, and what we do as individuals and employers freely choosing rather than mandating anything on anyone. Well, so you talk in the book, and this is, I think, the chapter that I am um, most skeptical of. And so you're going to need to convince me on this one. But you talk about incentives that employers can offer to attempt to ease the burden of having a lot of children. Doesn't this just create extraordinary levels of resentment between the childless and the child having? Like, why should, you know, our colleagues without children be subsidizing the actions of breeders like me and Zach? Well, because we humans are not a consumption good in other words if if you said look i think the employer i think reason should pay for my tattoos and then 
Peter Suderman and Stephanie Slade, who don't want or have tattoos, to my knowledge, said, wait, <laughs> we're, we're not going to get tattoos. Why should the tattooed be subsidized by us? I would say, it's well, it's not think as outlandish are... of an idea as you think it is, Tim. <laughs> Reason has paid and for what... one of Liz's tattoos for a <laughs> documentary. Zach helped me <laughs> with this scheme. <laughs> Um, well, that's great. I hope it wasn't like a, a Mises or a Rand tattoo or anything like that. Oh, no, that would be um, despicable. <laughs> as long as it's artwork, I, I can get behind it, I suppose. But um, so subsidizing everybody's tattoos, it kind of leaves the, the people who know they're not going to choose tattoos feeling like, well, couldn't we just have paid everybody a little bit more and then you can choose to get a tattoo with your money? That argument doesn't apply for people. And this is, again... The, the, you'll detect a religious underpinning in this argument, but people are people. People are that for which the sake, the, for the sake of which we make government policy or company policy. And I am explicit that the neutrality <clears throat> that we ought to have towards in government policy or employer policy, do you have a Tesla or not? Do you drive or not? Do you have tattoos or not? I don't think that neutrality is fit for family and for children. I think we actually ought to take the side of families because what are we doing? We're taking the side of people, which is the natural and good choice to make. And the argument would be different if we had a birth rate of 3.0 or if everybody was achieving what their desired uh, family size was, but seeing so many people fall short of their desired family size for a generation now on something so important and to see that family and work are the two main competitors for our time. I do think that it's fitting and appropriate for an employer to come out and say, and again, I'm not saying they should have to, but I'm glad when pro family employers do come out and say, actually, we're going to support and we're going to accommodate family in a way that we're not going to necessarily accommodate everything else. And to be clear, when I was the opinion page editor here, my accommodation of family included telling the 24 year old to go home and spend time with her sick dad while he was in the hospital. It's not just parents who were accommodating family with, but that is practically going to be uh, the, the biggest source of family accommodation is accommodating parents. So is that totally fair and equitable by some measures? No, I think it is ultimately fair and just to say, your family is the most important thing. You know, one of the the major developments that I've seen just anecdotally, and also there does seem to be some evidence uh, empirically for this that has increased family formation and uh, people having, uh, well, specifically people having more babies. There's a little baby boomlet post COVID, and some of that may have been attributed to or attributable to. Uh, remote the rise of remote work and just more flexible working arrangements that seems to have given people a little more uh, breathing room to take their kids to soccer practice or whatever needs to be done and maybe opened up more possibilities for considering more ha having more kids are there things that can be done you know in a more neutral way to just further enable that trend because to me, that seems like one of the biggest changes in my working lifetime. The fact that people have more flexible working arrangements um, seems yeah. more amenable to having more kids. So I, I do definitely think that flexibility in all dimensions is uh, is really important to this. And in fact, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist, Claudia Golden, I, she just won the Nobel Prize recently. She has done all the research on uh, gender and pay and work and all of that. And what she realized is that the gender gap, the difference in pay between men and women in similar jobs with similar amount of education is entirely due to the fact that women demand more flexibility. That in fact, that mothers demand more flexibility. So A, one of my answers is, hey, men, you should demand more flexibility too. B is the more that you can make your place of work, if you're the, the boss, be more flexible, the better it is for family. And again, this also benefits the guy who's a golf addict and he wants to be golfing all the time if, if he has flexibility. Um, so definitely, absolutely. And that not every job should have to be 
40 plus hour full time or just a 1099. So that's a place where government policy is, you know, guys know that horrible law in California. What is it? SB5. That uh, basically 85, outlaws, yeah. 85 basically outlaws contract work. That's absolutely an anti-family uh, law. So the more that we can allow people to scale up and scale down through public policy and workplaces make it very explicit. I think of journalism, but I think of uh, a, a woman I worked with who, when she got married, she's like, I basically want to have a baby right away. And so we switched her to editing outside contributor pieces because that was perfectly made for working for home while the, the sort of day to day writing and interacting with other writers and bosses and making phone calls and checking sources that that didn't lend itself to working from home with a baby. And so we tried to cultivate jobs for half time stay at home moms or dads. That's really something that can be done neutral towards what you're splitting your time with. It could be splitting your time with your parents, splitting your time with hiking, splitting your time because eh, I've paid off my mortgage. I'm 50. I don't really want to work full time, but I do want to do some work that all of that. There are some policies that need to be changed to make that more feasible and employers adopting that would be both family friendly as well as ultimately neutral towards what you're spending your yeah. other time. It, it almost seems like the divide between uh, the, the two, I guess, the progressive family, pro-family side and the conservative pro-family side is like the progressive vision is kind of like. Uh, we need to have all these um, like unlimited universal daycare, um, but also we're not going to allow the, this, these kind of flexible job arrangements. So you're going to be working full time and your kid's going to be totally covered in daycare. And your side of the equation is like, well, if you want people to make uh, if you want people to have the optionality to have more kids, let them have more flexible working arrangements and just give them straight up cash because they can use it how they want to raise their families. Is that kind of the, yes. so the, the battle in, in, you're fighting? In book, yeah. In the book, I definitely, I say a, a tax credit that, that currently exists is basically almost an equalizer with, so that I, I use the example of five guys who live in a, I actually was thinking of five specific guys who lived in a bachelor pad in the suburbs right next to another family of five with the same in aggregate income, they should have the same aggregate taxes. That's what the current child tax credit does. I would expand it a tiny bit by uh, indexing it for inflation and rolling in some other parent specific child tax credit for such as for daycare and just have it be straight cash and let people make the decision. Because a lot of people would decide to work a little less and spend a little bit more time with their kids. And a lot of people would decide to spend it on daycare and to work a little bit more. And so in that regard, I, I do call for more of a policy neutrality, while there are a lot of people who say, no, our GDP needs those women in work. Let's instead do a nudge to nudge um, every both parents into working 40 hours a week full time outside of the home. And at the same time, subsidize the daycare industry. I think that's really bad policy making. To me, the thing that's so sad about um, so much of the progressive push for universal, you know, pre-K and universal daycare is that it acts as though people all have the same values and it acts as though all families want to farm their children out to uh, entities, you know, picked or approved by the state. And at least for me and my family, that is not true. Uh, I would much rather spend more time with my kid. And I'm incredibly grateful to have a workplace that allows me to, I start my day at 5 a.m. Most people at Reason start their days, you know, at 9 a.m. or sometimes a little bit later than that. Um, but I feel lucky because I write the morning newsletter for Reason. And so at 5 a.m. before anybody else in my house is awake, I get to actually have you know, my little chunk of intense, deep focus work time for the day. And that type of thing, I think, you know, there's something so frustrating about the universal approach, the universal this, universal that, uh, that's so frequently favored by statists, um, you know, of all varieties. And it's like, well, what would happen if instead we enabled families to use their time and money as they see fit in a way that is in accordance with their values versus values that are imposed top down? To me, it, it's very profoundly frustrating. No, I, I think that's that's exactly right. And I get frustrated. I would read the academic studies while working on family unfriendly. And I would just see the the absolute premise of half of these academics was simply how can we get 
more parents to be putting in a combined 80 hours a week outside the home. And very rarely was it considered that, well, how can we give parents more flexibility to have the work-life balance that they would optimally have? Though one thing that I do want to focus on before we move on from this topic, because I know Zach wants to talk about housing policy uh, in a little bit, but don't the childless already subsidize us all so much in that their property taxes pay for K-12 schools? What do you make of, of that component of this? Where like, isn't the better approach to try to make it so as few of us are subsidizing the choices of other people as possible and to attempt to unwind the terrible place that we've already gotten to? Or are you just saying we really need to scrap neutrality and we need to be as a society like all in favor of trying to promote people? The, if you look at the, the subtitle of Family and Friendly, it's how our culture made raising children harder than it needs to be. So most of the places in which I'm saying we should have accommodation and preference for family over uh, that, that those are cultural changes rather than government policy. And again, my argument for a child tax credit that's slightly bigger than it currently is, is a fairness and neutrality one. And mm -hmm. But I do think um, there are people who say children are a public good. I don't <laughs> like that way of talking um, because uh, for a variety of reasons that I think you guys could all figure out. But I do think that we should say, well, you know what? Actually, children that a public policy should be oriented not just towards the present, but towards the future. And it's hard to talk about this without getting sounding super cheesy, but like children are the future. I, I think I avoid saying that line in the book because it's too cheesy, but that helping people raise children, even with pretty secular values is a way of saying, okay, we're gonna help people attain their desires or get closer to their desires in very important things. And we're going to help guarantee that there is a future which is not guaranteed in a place like South Korea. And so I don't support huge chunks of cash for parents for a variety of reasons. One, I think ultimately you do run into an unfairness argument. I absolutely believe that choosing a childless life, an unmarried life, uh, whatever is, um, is a totally valid choice. Catholics have always believed that, and not just for priests and nuns, but also for other people. I absolutely understand that a lot of people who want to have kids don't end up having kids and can feel like they're getting ripped off if they're constantly subsidizing uh, families. But I do think the culture should be set up. There's this term that gets used a lot of times in progressive identity politics that something is too blank normative, cis normative, heteronormative, et cetera. Sometimes that's a problem, but I think the, the right balance is often to be normative, but tolerant. And I think to be family normative and single or child free tolerant is the, the right balance that we expect people. Most people are going to get married and have kids. Some people are going to choose not to. Some people are just not going to end up doing it. And so the the sort of hardcore pro-natalist approaches you see that they're trying in Hungary or that some conservatives and a, a smaller portion of progressives want. I, I don't think that's the right way to go, but I also don't think that the complete hewing to neutrality is the, the right way to go. And if you're going to resent that we are being pro-family, that, that's what I hope in, in the book to argue against. And I, I spent a lot of pages arguing, well, actually, even if you don't want to have kids, you should want other people to be having the families that they desire. And right now, we're erring in the side of people are not getting the families that they say they desire. What role does technology play in all this? I mean, to go back to the idiocracy uh, moment for, for a second where you've got the yuppie couple who just waits too long and then they biologically cannot have a kid anymore. Um, obviously, if we've got IVF, but to the extent that that improves life's, if lifespans continue to get longer and uh, even thinking way out there, you hear about artificial wombs and stuff like that. Will that play potentially play a role if part of the issue is people delaying to the 
point where they're not able to have the family size that they had dreamed of when they were younger? Well, certainly right now, a large portion of the, the shortfall of women getting fewer kids than they want happens because of a combination of a delay and then sort of bad luck and biological clocks. In other words, if you choose to start your family in your 30s, you're increasing the risk that you won't be able to have as many. You're not guaranteeing, it's not even above 50%, but you're increasing the risk that you won't get the two or three kids that you want. <clears throat> but ultimately, the reason I'm skeptical of some technological fixes to this is because I think that the, the planning mindset is a sort of uh, fatal conceit. The idea that, oh, with enough technology, with enough planning, we can build the life that we want free of these other problems. I think that really is a, a hubris. It's an, over, um, it's an overestimation of our own ability to plan what we want and to know what we want. I kind of celebrate at the end of the book the unplannedness of children and life with children. Every child is unplanned is one of the quotes I have in there. Because even if you wanted to have a child, you didn't get to choose this specific child. I tell the story of when my oldest daughter was born and we had picked her name, we had done her nursery, we were totally ready for her. We, we knew we wanted to get married and have a honeymoon baby. This was, we had basically, I was hoping it was gonna be a girl first. We had basically planned this child. She's born and I look at her, I think, who is this? I've never met this girl before. <laughs> How am I supposed to like make her my roommate for the next 18 years when she's a total stranger? And sure enough, like every child is unplanned and that serendipity that it introduces into life is good. So that's one reason that I don't fall into sort of thinking tech and planning can solve all our problems because I think the, the human mind is such that when we try to plan too much, we end up messing stuff up. You know, speaking of planning and fatal conceits, I want to uh, we're going to wrap this up with the t a little discussion about urban planning and housing and the role that this plays. Um, I, I mean, we've seen again post pandemic. There's been an acceleration, uh, accelerated migration um, from some of the big coastal areas to the Sun Belt cities. I was part of that. Um, and there's a real question about, you know, are, are, I mean, one thing is like, are people flocking to the Utahs of the world where, um, it, you know, is, is that how some of this gets resolved is kind of mm -hmm. flocking to more family friendly areas. You have a chapter in the book, which is just one of the greater greatest uh, chapter titles I've ever seen. <laughs> Want fecundity in the sheets, give us walkability in the streets. Maybe just start there. What what do you yeah. mean by that? So one of the key needs of parents is the ability to ignore their children and not feel bad about it. And so Gen X, we used to, what our parents told us was, okay, make sure when the street lights come on, that's when you come home. So ride your bike, walk, go wherever you want. That's harder where I moved out of during the pandemic, Montgomery County, the streets were three, four lanes in each direction. It was not walk. There weren't sidewalks in a lot of places. And so if our kids needed to get somewhere, they needed to be driven. Small local high schools are re replaced by regional massive high schools, uh, which get uh, economies of scale, but means nobody gets to walk to school. The walking that children do, do is way down. My brother lives in Connecticut. He can almost hear the crowd cheer at his daughter's little league softball field because it's less than a mile away, there is no way she could walk there because there's no sidewalks and the only street has people going 50 miles an hour each way. So urban planning is a place where very explicitly, this is where the government needs to be pro-family and it has been family unfriendly to this date. They, they don't build sidewalks. I think the, the, and the speed limits are too high and a lot of conservatives and some libertarians are kind of instinctively pro-car in a lot of ways that I think is a big mistake. It needs to be easy for kids to sort of run the neighborhood. Then you need less um, less planning of their activities, less driving, less time in what I call car hell with the buckling and the unbuckling and the rebuckling that you guys both know very well. And then obviously and there's- um, hater, so I don't have to deal with this to the degree that you, you guys do. But that's a deliberate that. choice because I'm a car hater, right? Like. I mean, I am very sympathetic to the idea that Robert Moses is to blame for like people failing to oh, have yeah. unprotected sex, right? Like that is 
something that I am definitely <laughs> interested in. Because for me, at least, the idea of attempting to get children in and out of car seats, and especially like your car size then limits the amount of car seat uh, bound children you can have. So it necessarily has all of these family planning imp implications. It's a car huge seat issue. Has exception was that that was the study that I cited that because the car seat mandates rolled out at different times, multiple studies have shown that people are much more likely to stop at two kids. Um, just to wrap it up, as long as we're talking about policy, though, allowing it's it's really complicated because um, allowing more density does allow for sort of more playgrounds and makes housing more affordable and that sort of stuff, but. Big apartment buildings are, do not turn out to be family friendly because they don't turn out to be community friendly, right? This is one of the things that surprises a lot of people because in college, you might have lived in something that felt kind of like a big apartment building and everybody knew each other. But in adult life, um, the average American apartment building is not pro-communal. And because you need community to raise kids, those don't end up working. As we were talking earlier, you need a mix of lots of different things. You need garden apartments that surround a courtyard with a playground. You need single family homes, but not with minimum lot sizes that drive up the price of houses and make it impossible for someone to start a family. And so it would be a lot of sort of A, deregulation, B, promotion of a, uh, a mixture of different types of housing. And then the stuff that the city, that the government has to do, which is pave the sidewalks and pave the bike trails and build the playgrounds. That is really a, a huge part of this. And again, I, I don't support neutrality. I support how do we build this so as to make this a place that young people will move and want to start families. But I've, I've got to just point out this sort of uh, empirical reality of where people have been moving. I'm going to pull up one of those uh, pie charts that uh, urbanists who talk about walkability kind of hate which is, uh, this is from the Urban Reform Institute showing that, you know, 50% uh, of people live in a low density suburban environment, another 42% in a higher density suburban environment. America just has been getting more suburban and the kind of revealed preference is for the cars, the detached single family homes and so forth. So how do you cope with or you know deal with that reality while also making neighbor trying to you know push for neighborhoods yeah. to become more family friendly I, there's what i call kid walkability versus hipster walkability one of my friends joked that so many urbanists they what they're really saying is i need to be able to walk to a great cocktail bar which is fine. I used to be able to walk to a great neighborhood pub and i loved it but kid walkability and bikeability might mean you're driving to work you're driving um, your your kid to their Boy Scout meeting or their Girl Scout meeting or whatever, but the playgrounds and the schools and the 7-Eleven where they're going to buy Slurpees and taquitos, that they get to those on themselves. So a, a mm. suburb can be sort of pro-commuter, pro-single family home while also having kid walkability at the same time. Tim, I want to close us out, but before I do, I want you to give us your 30-second pitch for why libertarians skeptical of your argument should come over to the light side uh, and, and be on board. Yeah, yeah. Give us your 30-second pitch because I feel like I'm a little bit of a fence sitter on this issue. I feel very torn between uh, my Catholic peers and my libertarian ones. And then my actual personal experience of like, I really, really value spending time with my kid. I really hope to have a large family at some point. Give us your 30 second sort of closing argument for why people should come over to your side uh, with libertarians in mind. So first of all, a lot of what I'm arguing for is a, a kind of neutrality and fairness, and it's about changing the culture rather than government policies to inflict this uh, top down. But I think a more childless society will make people more statist and make people more depressed about the future and make people more fearful. I think that when people have kids, they're more hopeful for the future. They're more trusting of their neighbors. A more trusting communal society is a place where people rely on norms and neighborhoods and uh, goodwill. And they're less likely to think that the only source of their goods and their needs is going to be the state. So more babies equals more freedom. 
Fair enough. Thank you so much for talking to Reason, Tim Carney. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and Facebook page every Thursday and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Friday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.